Welcome to section 11 of the Renal Physiology Review. In section 11, we will go into more detail on the regulation of water balance and plasma osmolality. Welcome to section 11 of the Renal Physiology Review. In section 11, we will go into more detail on the regulation of water balance and plasma osmolality. Once again, recall that the kidney is responsible for maintaining body homeostasis. One of the key features of homeostasis is regulating plasma osmolality. Renal water handling is regulated by changes in osmolality, or reflected clinically by changes in serum sodium concentration. Both hypoosmolality and hyperosmolality can produce serious neurological symptoms, even leading to death. The kidneys respond to changes in plasma osmolality by adjusting water excretion. If the fluid intake is high, that is, there is more free water intake, if there was no modification of the urine, then serum sodium concentration would fall and plasma osmolality would fall. Once again, the kidney is responsible for, for preventing this from happening. It does this by excreting a more dilute urine. Dilute urine is essentially free water in excess of solute. This prevents a significant drop in serum osmolality. On the other hand, if fluid intake is low, then if there was no modification, serum sodium concentration would rise and plasma osmolality would also increase. Once again, the kidney is responsible for preventing this from happening. So therefore, a concentrated urine is excreted. This allows for the loss of solute and excess of free water. However, there must be some urine volume created because there is a obligatory solute excretion that's necessary for daily functional activity. However, the creation of a concentrated urine or more water reabsorption prevents a significant increase in serum osmolarity. The final urine concentration depends on the presence or the absence and the activity of ADH. ADH primarily acts in the collecting duct and regulates how much water is excreted versus how much water is reabsorbed. We'll walk through this in more detail in the next few slides. One thing to recall is that there is an obligatory amount of urine that must be created. There are daily Waste products that are created through normal metabolic processes. These waste products must be excreted. How much urine volume in total is necessary is dependent on the kidney's concentrating ability as well as the body's solute production. For a normal diet of approximately 600 milliosmoles of solute production and a maximum concentrating capacity of 1200 milliosmoles per liter, the obligatory urine output is approximately 500 ml in a normal person. As renal function deteriorates, or if solute production is either too high or too low, then this number can change. But the important number to remember is 500 ml, and the maximum concentrating ability of the kidney is 1,200 milliosmoles per liter. The activity of ADH and how ADH activity is governed is an extremely important concept to remember for your step one exam. Let's walk through some of the basics of ADH. There are two types of ADH receptors. There's V1 receptors in the vasculature and V2 receptors in the kidney. The permeability of water in the medullary collecting duct is determined by the ADH concentration. Without ADH present, the collecting duct is impermeable to water. However, in the presence of ADH, there is insertion of water channels, known as aquaporins, into the luminal membrane of the collecting duct epithelium. This allows water to be reabsorbed. It also allows water to be reabsorbed in the absence of solute, producing a more concentrated urine. ADH, if you recall, is released from the pituitary gland. Increases in plasma osmolality are sensed by the hypothalamus. This then stimulates the pituitary gland to release ADH. ADH is released into the circulation, 
which both stimulates thirst to increase water intake to combat increased osmolality, but also acts in the kidney itself to increase water reabsorption, which will also lead to a fall in plasma osmolality. Let's walk through a couple different scenarios. Once again, this is an extremely important concept for the step one exam. In the absence of ADH, dilute urine is formed. We said that concentrated tubular fluid is diluted by active sodium chloride reabsorption in both the thick ascending limb and the distal tubule. As you recall, these are two known as the diluting segments of the nephron. Thus, hypotonic fluid arrives at the medullary collecting duct. In the absence of ADH, the collecting duct epithelial cells are impermeable to water, and a very dilute urine is excreted. However, in the presence of ADH, the medullary interstitium is concentrated further, increases from 600 milliosms to, per liter to 1200 milliosms per liter. Dilute urine arrives at the collecting duct, which in the presence of ADH is water permeable. ADH stimulates the insertion of aquaporins, which then promote water reabsorption. The water reabsorption is facilitated by the increased concentration of the interstitial fluid and the increased osmolality of the interstitial fluid. Water reabsorption occurs and a much more concentrated urine is produced. The maximum concentration capacity of a healthy kidney is 1,200 milliosms per liter. How this interstitium is becomes more concentrated is through urea transport, which we'll walk through in the next few slides. In the presence of ADH, urea concentration of the tubular fluid of the cortical and automedullary collecting tubules becomes high, as ADH allows for water to reabsorb by open water channels. ADH also stimulates the production of specific urea transporters, increasing the permeability of the collecting tubules to urea. Urea then is reabsorbed from the tubules into the interstitium. Increased urea reabsorption leads to a more hypertonic medulla, which enables further urinary concentration and water reabsorption. Let's walk through this again and the importance of urea. In the presence of ADH, urea is reabsorbed from the medullary collecting duct into the interstitium. It diffuses from the interstitium into the descending and thin ascending loops of Henle. These segments are not permeable to urea, so urea remains trapped within the tubular fluid as it passes through the DCT and the cortical collecting duct. Urea then arrives at the medullary collecting duct. In the presence of ADH, urea transporters are increased, and so increased urea reabsorption occurs. The increased urea reabsorption promotes increased water reabsorption, allowing for the concentration of urine. The urea then is recycled back into the thin ascending and descending limbs of the loop of Henle. This process then repeats itself as long as further urinary concentration is necessary. One can see by this mechanism how urea plays an extremely important role in the final concentrating mechanism of urine. Further, it's important to remember for your step exam that ADH directly stimulates the reabsorption of urea through the presence of increased presence of urea transporters. Secretion of ADH is controlled by two mechanisms. We already outlined the hypothalamic osmoreceptors that sense plasma osmolality. Increased plasma osmolality leads to increased ADH secretion. However, systemic baroreceptors also play a role in ADH secretion. As we've said, ADH both has activity in the kidney as well as in the periphery as it acts as a vasoconstrictor. So in the setting of decreased baroreceptor pressure sensation, usually in the setting of decreased effective circulating volume, ADH activity is stimulated. Therefore, ADH secretion is stimulated by 
increase in plasma osmolality, decrease in plasma volume, and angiotensin II, which would also be stimulated by decreased plasma volume. AD secretions is inhibited by low plasma osmolality, is also inhibited by increases in effective circulating volume. Once again, let's walk through these two different scenarios. We start with a normal plasma osmolality of 270 milliosmoles per kilogram. If we add water without any other changes, osmolality would fall. This, this fall in osmolality is sensed by the hypothalamic osmoreceptors and turns ADH off. The decreased ADH activity then makes the collecting duct impermeable to water. Water cannot be reabsorbed and dilute urine is created. Dilute urine is created and more free water is excreted. Plasma osmolality is restored back to normal. Let's take the opposite scenario. You start out with 270 milliosmoles per kilogram and you lose free water alone. Plasma osmolality increases to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram. This increase in osmolality is, is also sensed by hypothalamic osmoreceptors. Two processes to correct osmolality are stimulated. One, the release of ADH, and two, thirst. By thirst, increased water, free water is ingested. This should also lead to a fall in plasma osmolality. Increased ADH activity makes the collecting duct permeable to water. When the collecting duct is permeable to water, more water can be reabsorbed, there's a more concentrated urine that is excreted, and plasma osmolality is restored back to normal. Let's walk through this again, the renal response to increases in plasma osmolality. When there's an increase in plasma osmolality, this is sensed by the hypothalamic osmoreceptors. This stimulates ADH secretion by the pituitary gland, as well as thirst. ADH stimulates the insertion of water channels into the tubular epithelial cells of the collecting tubules. It also stimulates the placement of urea transporters in the tubular epithelial cells. The urea, increased urea reabsorption facilitates increased water reabsorption. There is decreased free water excretion, or also known as decreased free water clearance, and plasma osmolality ultimately will return to normal because of their increased water reabsorption, as well as the thirst, which promotes increased water ingestion. On the other hand, if there's a decrease in plasma osmolality, hypothalamic osmoreceptors sense this, and this triggers the inhibition of further ADH secretion. The collecting duct tubules will remain impermeable to water, urea transport will not be upregulated, and a more dilute urine is excreted, also known as increased free water clearance. It, this returns plasma osmolality back to the normal range. So let's walk through the, the regulation of ADH secretion once again. It's controlled by both the hypothalamic osmoreceptors and the systemic baroreceptors. ADH secretion is stimulated by changes in osmolality and is inhibited by a fall in osmolality. This is also stimulated by decrease in effective circulating volume or plasma hypovolemia and is inhibited by plasma hypervolemia or increase in effective circulating volume. This graph reflects the two major mechanisms governing ADH secretion. The black solid line reflects the osmotic control of ADH secretion. As you can see, as osmolality increases, ADH proportionally and directly increases. The magenta line reflects the volume or pressure regulation of ADH. You can see at smaller changes in in plasma volume, there are minimal changes in ADH concentration. However, once there's a greater than 10% change in 
effective circulating volume, ADH is stimulated. If effective circulating volume falls by greater than 10%, this will stimulate ADH release, even in the setting of hypoosmolality. Once again, the key concept to remember is that the body attempts to preserve circulating volume at all costs, even at the expense of osmolality at this level of extreme volume depletion. At normal levels of volume fluctuation, ADH release is primarily governed by changes in osmolality. However, at extremes, falls in effective circulating volume will also stimulate ADH secretion. In general, only pathologic hypovolemia will influence ADH levels. And again, at normal ranges, ADH concentration is primarily de dependent on osmolality. Let's compare the two mechanisms of regulation of ADH. There's a significant change in the volume status will shift the ADH osmolality curve. With hypovolemia of greater than 10%, more ADH will be released than would otherwise be released at a given osmolality. This is reflected in the graph to the right of the slide. Normally, ADH release is governed by changes in plasma osmolality. However, if there is a 10% or more decrease in effective circulating volume, even at a low plasma osmolality, ADH secretion will be stimulated. Again, this is to preserve effective circulating volume. Alternatively, if there is a greater than 10% increase in effective circulating volume, then ADH level will be inhibited, even at the setting of increased plasma osmolality. Clinically, the much more relevant scenario is when there is a greater than 10% fall and effective circulating volume. Once again, the primary goal is to preserve effective circulating volume. So even when plasma osmolality falls, ADH will be stimulated. This is not true under normal circumstances. In the setting of severe hypovolemia, the body prioritizes volume over osmolarity. ADH levels increase, water is retained in excess of sodium. It may result in a hypoosmolar state, but it minimizes the further drop in volume. In extreme situations, osmolality is sacrificed in favor of volume maintenance. This goes back to this diagram demonstrating how these two systems interact. Once again, effective circulating volume is primarily governed by the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. With Minor changes in effective circulating volume, the renin angiotensin II aldosterone activity is regulated. However, when there is a greater than 10% fall in effective circulating volume, the body attempts to preserve circulating volume by stimulation of ADH as well. Normally, remember, ADH is only governed by body osmolality. Angiotensin II plays a direct role in this crosstalk as angiotensin II stimulates directly ADH release. Let's go through a question. Which of the following factors will inhibit the release of antidiuretic hormone? A, an increase in plasma osmolality. B, a decrease in plasma osmolality. C, a decrease in plasma volume. D, a decrease in systemic blood pressure. E, an increase in circulating angiotensin II levels. The correct answer is, of course, B, a decrease in plasma osmolality. All the other scenarios are scenarios where ADH activity will be stimulated. Question 11. A decrease in which of the following will cause the release of ADH from the posterior pituitary? Plasma sodium concentration, A plasma potassium concentration, B, plasma volume, C, plasma pH, D, or plasma bicarbonate concentration, E. The answer, of course, is C, plasma volume. This is the crosstalk we have been 
going on about. A fall in plasma volume of greater than 10% will stimulate the release of ADH from the posterior pituitary to increase water reabsorption and preserve circulating volume. ADH has no activity on plasma pH, plasma bicarbonate, or plasma potassium concentration. This concludes Section 11 of the Renal Physiology Review. The key points to remember from Section 11 are that vasopressin, or ADH, is primarily responsible for the regulation of plasma osmolality. Normally, osmolality alone is a stimulus for ADH release. However, at extreme changes in circulation, osmolality balance and volume balance are coupled, which can lead to derangements in osmolality.